The two people who've suffered losses to violence then committed themselves to helping others who've survived the same. Michael Patrick McDonald is the author of All Souls, a great bestseller about growing up in South Boston. He lost siblings to violence and to suicide. It's good to see you, Michael. See you too. And Tina Cherry, whose teenage son died in a crossfire, then founded Dorchester's Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute in his name. Tina, it's great to see you Thanks again. As well. Let me start with you. Uh, your son, we've had this discussion, 15 years old, going to a Teens Against Gang Violence meeting is gunned down. In the years I've known you, it seems the central mission has been to give voice to people who've lost somebody they love. Is this where this all comes from, this collaboration? Is that what this is about? It is. Um, you know, Lewis had a voice and really taking away that stigma that young male in urban settings, you know, do not have goals, dreams, and vision. And that really was not who Lewis was. And it's really not who our community is. And meeting Michael, that's how I met Michael, you know, white guy from South Boston in the heart of Dorchester and a black woman from Dorchester going into the heart of South Boston. Really two communities, class and cultures coming together in the midst of our pain and suffering. So what is this, the rest of the story deal? What, what is this thing? Like? So the curriculum is, is a, a writing curriculum helping survivors to transform their trauma into voice and agency. So like Tina is an example of that over the years. Tina and I go way back to the, the week Lewis was murdered. I, um, I, was, I was organizing a, a, an exhibit at City Hall for the gun buyback program. We were putting the pictures and stories of young people who were gunned down in Boston in City Hall um, in the lobby. And Tina came right out and she, she spoke within, within that week. And um, we've been friends ever since. So back in the day, we were always working with survivors in our different communities but ultimately trying to bring them together. And that was something that was happening as far back as 21 years ago. To tell their stories, and when, it, when the times I've been lucky enough to be at events with Tina, it, it, the thing that sticks with me is you get to learn particularly how a young person lived as opposed to just knowing how they died, which is what most of us do. Right. I, is that the motivation? Why does this work? Why does this help a survivor as well to as tell the, their story? As well, so not only the story about the atrocity and, and about the, 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 the victim, but also about our lives before and after that. You know, the, the larger story, the rest of the story, and the fact that we're still here. That's what we call the project with the Peace Institute. We're still here. The reason it matters is because, um, I mean, you know, um, brain specialists, uh, trauma specialists talk about how the part of the brain most impacted by trauma, by violence and sudden death, and especially if people are growing up in situations where they're constantly um, suffering violence and, and traumatic situations. Uh, the part of the brain most impacted is the part of the brain that's responsible for words, language, speech, the story. So exercising that part of the brain, telling the trauma story, allows one to integrate that into their lives. Is that and what happened to you? I think that's what happened. We kind of both, I think, fell out in, you know, we, we found our way to that remedy intuitively and other people just need to be shown the way to that to that agency. So voice is agency ultimately. How hard is it to convince somebody who's lived through what you've lived through and who you work with as closely as you have for years that this is a good outlet? I mean, it's, see, whenever I hear these kinds of things, I say to myself, you know, on one hand, I don't want to talk about this. I wouldn't right, want to talk about this right. anymore. But you have to try to convince them that talking about it is a catharsis, is well, a it's, something. It's not even convincing. See, we have other people wanting to tell our story, and they want mm, to tell the story true. about the horror and mm. the revenge and the anger and the rage. That's what and people that, like uh, me, yeah, unfortunately, Yeah, like you, do. exactly. I know, I know, Always I know. want to know that. I know. Yet, though, there's another side of who we have, the mm. resiliency, the healing, our faith, how we walk and how we honor. So it's really not hard to convince mm. the families. I mean, we were looking for about maybe five or ten. We have, what, 12, 13? Four weeks, and they don't want to stop. They want right. to continue. And do they have writing experience? I mean, we're going to play in a second a part of a story one of these people told that is surreal. Do they some do and some, some do and some don't, and we work with people at all levels. But what was one of the most amazing things for me back in the day when I was hanging out with Tina 21 years ago, uh, we were organizing citywide with the mothers from Charlestown, the Charlestown after murder mm -hmm. program, South Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan. A lot of times it was myself, as a, at the time I was in my early 20s, and mostly women in their 40s and 50s and 60s whose kids were murdered. The first day I walked in, the, the, the Peace Institute is, has, has broadened the population that we're, that we're able to reach. Because I walked in, it was that population, the moms, but also siblings, best friends, cousins, mm -hmm. 
and they were young. There were young men in the room, like people in their early to mid twenties. And that's that's a whole new ball game for me too. Let me. Show, I wish we had time to share a whole one of these stories. This is just a little piece. This woman's name is Denise Cosby. Her son Justin was shot and killed in 09 in the basement of a building on Harvard's campus at a state house event that you all, Linda Dorsina Fori, organized called Survivors of Homicide Victims Awareness Month. She talked about her son's funeral in a room she described as being quote all too familiar. Here's just a little piece of that. It hurts so bad. I cannot look in his face. I never did like this room. Every time I'd gone there, someone was dead. But on this day, it's my baby. I'm filled with so much pain, and then I just go all numb. My heart bleeds, wounded beyond repair. Memories of our bonds of love, complete with the dark, stark, truth that lies before me in the casket. I cry and cry until I have no more tears. I've cried and cried, and I have not cried, and it has been years. My son, Justin, Devin, Cornelius, Daniel Cosby, was a victim of shooting. A senseless crime took him from me. I always taught Justin to reach for the sky, to believe. Now Justin has taught me to reach for the sky. Oh my God, you know when she says Justin, Devin, Cornelius, yeah. Daniel, yeah, Cosby him. is just it is. The naming is important. Is this is this not? I mean, it, it, as an outsider, this it's such an obvious way to try to. I don't know if heal is the proper verb, mm -hmm. but something is this. It's new, or has this been done in I other settings? I think it's age old. I think trauma? for me, I've always you know years ago been always being around survivors, people would think, you know, this, this must be a depressing life you're living, but it's so rich. I mean, you're, you're gonna be in contact with love like you've never experienced it before. That woman's love is what comes through in her story. Yeah, are things better? I mean, I, I, we talk about this all the time. Uh, uh, Bill Evans, the commissioner, was here last night, and while he goes out of his way to say any homicide is too much, 32 so far this year, down, well, I don't know, a third from last year, 50 at the same time, are things better? In Boston, are they safer in Boston than, than uh, uh, before you started your work, Jean? You know, I'm going to say yes because a lot of us are doing the work we haven't given up yet. I think what we need to move away is stop going back and starting with the numbers every year because for each victim, 32 mm -hmm. victims, research tells us there's at least eight to ten immediate families that are impacted. Mm -hmm. So for us, the victims are the victims. They're no longer here. Mm -hmm. And some of those survivors. victims I know from you are not just the people who lost someone they love, but someone who lost someone they love for, to prison. Exactly. Who was the shooter. Or who is the shooter. So we're, we're all interconnected into this. So while even if homicide is down, that survivor's population mm -hmm. has just risen mm -hmm. by eight to ten. Quickly, are things members. better than when you guys met a I, couple of decades ago? I think in terms of the work that's being done, a lot a lot's better, you know, and I, I never world. go by body body counts or yeah. anything like that, but what I what is better is that there is a place now for survivors with like with the Peace Institute. And the, back in the day there wasn't anything like this, you know, where people could turn to. And this work is prevention, it is intervention, mm -hmm. as well as treatment. So working with people after the atrocity is actually working with the population that's at risk for alcoholism, substance abuse, pain killing of all kinds, violence, suicide. So this is prevention as well as treatment. How do people find out more about this, Tina? They go to your website? Yes, ldbpeaceinstitute.org. And really to say that this would not have happened without the funding from the Mass Office for Victims Assistance. So that's really a turning point. Mm -hmm where that organization will without fund without, without the two of us, Michael, yes. Thank you. Good to see you, you again. Thank you so much. See you later. Yes.